text is found in Habakkuk, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4. I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. This self-sufficient age in which we live operates on the premise that we can always take charge of our lives. We are taught to believe that no matter what confronts us, with enough energy and courage, we can forge ahead and brush aside all obstacles and obstructions that impede our path. This take-charge attitude is imparted to us as wisdom. It is instilled in us early on. It is the premise upon which we are taught to succeed. That notion, this notion that we can always take charge of our lives, is the reason I believe so many love to quote William Ernest Henley's Invictus, which says, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. This sounds good. But the common understanding of it is not true, for it flies in the face of the providence of God. Too often those who recite these lines glean from them some sense that they alone are responsible for the outcome of their lives. The psalmist in the long ago had a better sense of our destinies when he said, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I suppose it is possible to think that we can always take charge of our lives, especially when we are young and healthy or reasonably prosperous, or when we are completely in charge of our mental faculties. It is possible to believe life will always respond to our strong-willed wishes and desires, especially when rank and privilege are our constant companions and the bright morning of opportunity shine so radiantly upon our paths. Under such circumstances, one could conclude that this take charge approach works in any and all situations. But the truth of the matter is that different seasons come to all our lives. There are seasons when all that we touch turns to gold. There are seasons when the next step in our lives is so clear and so close, we would seem foolish not to take it. There are those moments in life when God is in God's heaven and all is right with the world. But such times do not last forever. In truth, seasons of loss, helplessness, and waiting come to all our lives. One of life's most difficult lessons is learning how to wait on God through a dry and difficult season. A season where we are forced to wait in spite of our nerves of steel and steadfast prayers, in spite of the American mindset that tells us we can always take charge, we find ourselves unable to effect the kind of outcome we would like to see. It is for this reason, our difficulty in learning how to wait, that our text is taken from this strange, hard-to-find book called Habakkuk. This so-called minor prophet has a major word to say to us about how to wait on God. In Habakkuk, we find a word of encouragement for those who have grown impatient, waiting on the promises of God. We find a word of hope for those who, even now, are struggling to make sense of dashed hopes, shattered dreams, and uncertain futures. There is a word for people who, because of life's uneven journey, find themselves ailing and therefore in need of a prescription for hard times. Habakkuk is just what the doctor ordered. What is going on in the world of this 7th century prophet that ushers in his own season of waiting? Habakkuk complains to God about the rampant injustice in Judean society. He asks God how long he would allow the oppression of the weak by the strong among God's own people. And he wonders how long it will be before God brings judgment upon God's own wayward people. But Habakkuk does not like God's answer. For God tells him he will use a heathen king and a heathen army. 
Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to discipline his own people. This answer confuses Habakkuk. He knows that the Babylonians are no paragons of virtue, and he just cannot believe that a pure and holy God would stand idly by and watch them swallow up his people. Old Testament scholar J.J.M. J. Roberts says it is at this point that Habakkuk, unwilling to accept God's answer, talks back to God, as did other great people of faith in the Old Testament. Difficult seasons will make you talk back to God, not out of irreverence, but out of a sense of confusion and perplexity about the purposes of God in your life. It is easy to wait on God as long as we can make some sense of what God is doing, as long as there is some discernible design to the movement of God in our lives. But when God shocks us and surprises us and refuses to answer our prayers as we said them, when we said them, and how we said them, then it becomes difficult to wait and hard not to talk back. What do you do? when you are no longer sure how God is going to work out God's purpose in your life? What do you do when you are not even sure that God is at work in your life? You are unhappy where you are, and yet unsure about where God is leading. What do you do when you find yourself in a difficult season of waiting, where heaven is silent, or the trumpet is sounding forth an uncertain sound? Our natural instinct, especially those of us who have bought into the take charge attitude, is to make something happen, to try to make our season of waiting come to an end. It is here that T.S. Eliot's advice in Ash Wednesday is so appropriate. Teach us to sit still. There are seasons in all our lives when we shall have no choice but to wait. Though we have no choice but to wait, we do have a choice as to how we shall wait. Some people wait out a difficult season in a spirit of rebellion. They go through life angry and disheartened, and they make their displeasure known to any and all who will listen. Some wait out a difficult season in a spirit of resignation. Life for them loses all purpose and perspective, so they become cynical about life. and They trudge forward with a dull and listless spirit. Of God's guiding hand and tender mercies, they sarcastically proclaim, What will be, will be. There is, however, a third way to wait on God through our own dry and difficult seasons. And it is the weight of anticipation. Habakkuk suggests that this is the way the righteous wait. Their weight is alert and charged with expectation. Their stand is one of tiptoe anticipation. They wait in the fervent hope of a brighter tomorrow morning, when night with all its shadows will be passed away. Habakkuk, confused about the purposes of God in his life and the lives of his people, waits through a difficult season for an answer from God. Finally, God speaks to him of a vision whose fulfillment awaits its appointed time. An appointed time indicates a set time in the future, that can neither be rushed nor delayed. An appointed time means God has a fixed and ordered time to move decisively in our lives. Its arrival and duration are ordered by God and not by us. In the text before us, God does not even tell Habakkuk the contents of the vision. God simply assures him that it is a trustworthy vision that at the end shall speak and not lie. It is a vision in which Habakkuk can find security, for the one who reveals it is able to back up what he promises. When you wait on that which God has promised, it is not a lie on which you have fixed your heart. It is not a vain hope that will bear no fruit. It is a promise that will surely come. The one who makes this promise is none other than God, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who stands above the flux and flow of human history, the God who promises and cannot lie, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. This, God says, it will surely come. This is the word of hope I leave with you today. Dry and difficult seasons when we are forced to wait do not last forever. In their own way, 
they too are a part of the purposes of God. But when your season of waiting is over, what has been dry and desolate in your life shall blossom as a rose, and what has been so bitter to your soul shall be made sweet. Then you too can join in singing that old African-American spiritual, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do?